Good morning, fellow privateers. Welcome to the full week ahead preview from Privateer FX. Getting a little bit of a late start here, 8 o'clock Central Time. Been uh, traveling a bit. And uh, weather delays at the airport and blah, 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 whatever. You don't need to hear about that, <clears throat> but I'm back. Uh, anyhow, so the week at, the week ahead, um, obviously you know, last week we had a, a very dovish sounding Fed actually exceeded um, our expectations um, of their dov on the dovishness, and the, you know the market responded. They sold dollars, they bought stocks, they bought gold, they bought bonds. Ten-year yields dropped below two percent. So you know the week ahead. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest macro event risk coming up this week is the G20 meeting. Um, so it's really about the interplay be between the Fed that has essentially announced it's a 100% chance of a cut in July, and then the G20 meeting between Presidents Trump and Xi. Um curious to see how Trump plays this next hand with, you know, he essentially forced Powell and the Fed to be dovish, um, and that this is why he's had, you know, the, the, these tariffs have, have, have caused um, the tariff threats with Mexico, the tariffs with China, you know, caused some wobbliness in the equity market in May, and... Um, it essentially forced the, the Fed's hand to um, announce a, you know, not announce a cut in July, but prepare the market for a cut. And uh, I think we've said this before, that if the dovishness and the market keeps pushing these yields lower, we think that they will, the stock market and risk will be very disappointed if the Fed doesn't cut 50 basis points in July. So that's still a month or so away. Um, but yeah, how Trump is playing this next hand is going to be interesting because he he got the dovish sounding Fed. That's what he wanted. Stocks went and made new all-time highs, new um, all-time weekly high close, I believe. And, um, you know, he could, he could either... He could either keep the pressure on China, implement some some sort of tariff on the remaining goods, maybe a 10% versus the 25%, um, or come across as you know kind of a truce with G over the G20, and that would send the equity market through the roof. Um, so uh, again, it's a big week. Um, I was reading something, I think it was BAML, it put it out, um, 65% of the, uh, they, they did a, they did a survey, a sentiment survey last week, 65% of the, um, respondents said there will be no trade deal, but Xi and Trump agreed to delay any additional measures, meaning, no tariffs for the time being. No more tariffs for the time being. 18% um, say the presidents do not even meet or there is no agreement and the next round of tar tariffs is implemented. Um, then there's 15% saying the presidents agree to a narrow trade deal. Most existing tariffs remain in place. So, you know, I think that's kind of interesting how the... How the um, Respondents are thinking that there's really, really no deal, and they're going to kick the can down the road and revisit this later in the year. Um, what else do we have coming up this week? We've got the RBNZ. Uh, I think there's only a 20% chance of them cutting again, um, but I'm sure they'll be dovish sounding like every other central bank, save the uh, the only central bank hiking or even uh, remotely 
hawkish sounding as uh, the Norges Bank. That'll lend a massive tears one day. I think we talked about that a few times. Um, I was also looking at Merrill, uh, Bamel's most crowded trade that they put out every month. Uh, if you remember in May, the most crowded trade was long U.S. technology stocks, which then completely shit the bed in May, um, you know, down 15 plus percent uh, in June. Now we're, you know, June 23rd already. Um, the most crowded trade is long U.S. treasuries. And this is something we've been talking about for the past week. We have the trade of the week last week of um, selling the 10 years on a break of 210 in the yield. Um, we still like that trade. Um, I'm short some TLT, which is kind of a mix of a mix of uh, different maturities. Um, it's the ETF. So watch that. Uh, watch that. The, it is a very crowded long. The DSI, you know, was up in the 90s or something, and I, I think it's just kind of a matter of time before you see a correction and maybe a 210 to. 210 to, or sorry, a break of 210 would be, you know, maybe a pretty quickly to 220, 230, 240 even. Um, let me pull this up here while I got the chart. Ten-year yield right there. It's 205. Uh, last week the high was 211.60 and the low was just under 2 at 197.70, which was a target for, I believe it was Goldman's technicians. And uh, Greg McKenna had been mentioning this 197, 198. You can see how it bounced, um, yields bounced. So I'm wondering if a, a short-term low is in, and we'll start seeing some positioning wash out. Uh, we do have month end coming up as well. Um, some of the preliminary flows from our friends over at Barclays are, are seeing a um, strong dollar selling, and that is because the equity market in the U.S. is massively outperformed the others. Um, so it looks like a big dollar sell uh, in the month end. You know, we're still a few days away, but buying Euro, selling dollar yen, buying cable, selling dollar CAD, and buying Aussie. All right, well, let's hop to the charts. We showed you the 10-year yield. Um, that's a weekly. Uh, may as well pop over to the S&P 500. And you can see here this close. This is a cash, is a new all-time high cash close. In the futures, just shy of that weekly, high weekly close at the end of April before that big sell-off. Um, actually, yeah, it might, might have actually been right. It's pretty close. 29.48, what was the close here? 29. 49.25 in the futures, 29.48.25. So yeah, just shy, like one point shy. Bottom line is, you know, the, this looks like it wants to go up to 3,000. It's a lot of, a lot of commentators calling for that. Uh, the Nasdaq, we did not have a high weekly close. We're still about, you know, 100 some points from that. Um, I also was looking at a chart of the IWM versus the S&P. And I don't have it here, but IWM, which is a small cap um, ETF, is massively underperforming, and which generally uh, doesn't bode well for overall um, overall uh, stock market. Gold is, you know, I'd say that's the chart of the week if you had to look at anything. Um, we closed the week well above this old 1380 high that it's about a three and a half year old three and a half four year high um, took out all these all these highs all these highs here on the weekly 1365 so kind of 1365 to 1380 was like the big resistance zone we we closed well above that you can see we're rallying a bit here in Asia um, we still have this on <clears throat> we've peeled a little bit off just and, and, and raising our stops, but like buying dips back down to this 1365, 1380. Um, I just saw something, I don't know who it was, Forex Live, I think, talking about how Russia had bought a bunch of gold just before the breakout, which is kind of interesting. I would imagine they know how to 
they know how to trade gold pretty well, I would think. Um, let's go over to the currencies. Um, dollar index closed below the 200 day. Actually, oh, sorry, it's weekly. Hold on. Closed below the 200 day on Friday. Took out this old low from June, 96.50 ish. And looks like we're probably headed down to 95.50 to 95.75. Um, here's the weekly. It's an ugly week. So bearish engulfing week um, in the dollar index. And if we look at the euro, it's the same chart for the most part. We did close above the 200 day, which we haven't done in a while. Um, well, it's a 200 week. Hold on. Close above the 200 week and the 200 day. But as you can see here, if I'll scrunch this chart up, here's the 200-day moving average of euro. Um, we haven't been above it since May of 2018. Now, I'm not super excited about this yet, but give me a couple days of follow-through, and uh, you know, then I would say that uh, you know you could get some extensions and I think some of the technicians are calling for 115 area. Um, <clears throat> let's go back to the weekly on the euro. You can see here it was a bullish engulfing week and we had a, I think, let's see if this is right. Uh, not Sterling Closey. Hold on. Dollar Cat. Dollar Cat had a bearish engulfing week. Really got hammered. Obviously, oil oil was the best performer last week. I think it was up 10% last week. Um, Dollar Swissy, that one they started selling that. Here's here's something that's interesting. Wednesday was the Fed meeting, so it's Friday was this bar. Thursday was a big down bar. Wednesday, um, Wednesday morning it was down. I don't I don't need to pull up the hours, but it, we were down a bit on uh, before the Fed meeting for FOMC and uh, someone out of Switzerland obviously knew what was going on that they were going to sound uber dovish because um, that was leading all the other dollars that day. You can see here we've um, closed on the 200 day, you know, on the Fed day and it's looking pretty heavy. So I had a bearish engulfing week, pretty ugly bar. Next supports another 50 points lower. I could see this going back to those September lows, 95, 40, 50 area. I don't see why not. Um, and then dollar sing, another dollar we like to kind of keep an eye on. Um, that too had a bearish engulfing. And the only inside weeks of note was the lightless bird, the Kiwi dollar, which makes sense because we do have the RBNZ. We had a huge down week prior week and you know we're kind of holding into this area here still think it probably has scope for this 6425 area but had an inside week and that will be resolved so we'll be playing a break of either side of last week's range 66 10 we'll call it on the top side and 64 call it 90 uh, 64 90 on the downside um, so those are kind of your chart patterns, interesting chart patterns, the inside weeks, the outside weeks. Um, what else do we have? Dollar yen, what did that look like? Not quite a bearish golfing, but it did take out two weeks of lows. Um, obviously, you know, that was Fed driven. I believe the real low was 104. I think it was 104.30. Trading view showing 104.65, but you can see here, you can go back to this big week here in March of 18. That looks like a pretty important level, and I would imagine if this dollar continues to sell off, it's going down there. Um, Aussie, we've been playing it from the long side stubbornly. We stopped out once, we reinitiated last week and got a little lucky because we ended up buying it. Um, where did we buy it? 69, the figure I want to say it was. 
6885, somewhere around here. So we've had some pretty, you know, a couple, couple of good up days. Friday was a little bit indecisive, and now we're gapping. Our low is speaking about, um, I think he's talking about infrastructure spending should help support the economy. So you can see here we're above the, uh, the 15 and the 30-day uh, moving average, which, you know, once we closed under those, we had a pretty good sell-off from 69.60 all the way down to that low of 68.30. So this looks like it maybe wants to go back and test this old fractal up here. It's, you know, 70 cents was that big level that we um, messed around with and uh, kind of traded either side of 70 cents for a bit. So we're going to keep that. We're going to try keeping that long on. Um, we're long some gold. We're long some S&Ps. Short some bonds. Still long a little bit of copper and then long Aussie dollar. Um, so, you know, it is... You know, it's it's a pretty much a risk-on trade with a gold hedge. I kind of like it. Um, there hasn't been a whole lot of volatility in since I've added these positions, and I think it's because you know gold has obviously just been going straight up, which is helping protect any of the other uh, some of the other positions. But it's yeah, it's definitely more of a risk-on type trade, risk-on portfolio with a, a bit of a gold hedge. Um, let's go back to gold real quick here. Um, there, there, uh, I don't remember who it was. Someone was saying that the, um, sorry about that. Um, a lot of background noise tell the family to pipe down. Anyhow, so um, I can't remember who it was. It was either Tudor or it was Drunken Miller. Someone was saying that a break of 1400 in gold should uh, get to 1700 pretty quickly, which um, I don't know. I can't really argue that. Um, when it starts to trend, it really does go. Um, we, you know, we've played it from the short side to the long side over the years, and once it starts moving and once it breaks technical levels, you you can see some significant fall through. Um, let me just run a fib here. I'm curious. If we can go back all the way back to this old high at 1925 down to the 1050 lows. We're just above the third, which is 1384. That was that big resistance, 65 to 80. And then 1485 is the next level. So that's, you know, it's really not that far away. It went 50, 50 bucks last week. So um, we'll be keeping a close eye on that and, and then looking to buy dips and, and play the, uh, there's copper. Let's see what's copper, let's see what copper's doing. It was a pretty good week in copper, although we did close off the highs a bit. Get up to 273, close at 270. So after kind of an indecisive week, the prior week. So, anyhow, um, again, RBNZ, the big, the only real central bank meeting of note. Um, we got some data, some CPI data coming out of Europe. Uh, we have some GDP data, out of the U.S. final numbers, and uh, Canada, and then the G20 later in the week. So kind of think the market might be quiet here in the next 24 hour, 24 to 48 hours, and then uh, start positioning again for, for late week. All right, well, good luck. You'll hear from us on the European Open, and uh, have a great week ahead. Cheers.